As Syria's bloody civil war drags on, what drives those opposed to the Assad regime? What keeps them at the front line amid all the death and destruction, savagery and despair? Earlier this year, journalist Rania Abazaid went to Idlib province, a key battleground in the northwest of the country, to find out. Shimshi, in the northern Syrian province of Idlib. It's a small agricultural town surrounded by olive groves. It was once home to some 4,000 people, but most of its families have fled. They were driven out by fierce clashes between the rebel Free Syrian Army and troops loyal to Syrian President Bashar al-Assad. It looks like many towns in northern Syria, destroyed and largely devoid of civilians. It's from this string of ruined towns that rebels hope to turn the tide against Assad's forces by seizing control of this strategic province. These men belong to a unit of the nationwide Farouk brigades, part of the Free Syrian Army. We're close to the Wadi Daif military base, one of the Syrian army's last major positions in Idlib province. The base is protected by two large outposts, which serve as its first lines of defense. One of them, called the Zalani, is just beyond this house. Yeah, Ahmed. Go, 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 go. This war is being fought house to house, street to street, neighborhood to neighborhood. We're keeping low so the Syrian soldiers can't see us. The local Farouk leader, Hajj Zaki, used to be a metalsmith. He's a 38-year-old father of five. Like most of his men, he's from this town. Ahmad is a 25-year-old army defector. It's his turn to man this sniper position. This is the outpost, just beyond the no man's land, on the other side of the olive grove. Mahmoud worked in a clothing store in Damascus before he picked up a gun. As Syrian society fractures along ethnic and sectarian lines, the division between friend and enemy is becoming starker. He may be optimistic. Few think that the bloodbath will end with the fall of the regime. Like most front lines in Syria, there are several groups in the same area, and the Farouk are not the only ones here. These men are from other units that are also waiting to move on the outpost. <laughs> We're now heading south along the M5 highway. This stretch has recently been won by the rebels. The M5 is the main artery that links the capital Damascus to the central cities of Homs, Hama, and further north to Aleppo. It's a key land supply route used by the Syrian army. We have to come off the highway before we reach our destination, the town of Heish. That stretch of road belongs to the regime. The rebels of Heish are determined to change that, and the town has paid a price. It's under constant bombardment. Ooh. 
شو كانت هيدي؟ هاي ضربة راجل راجل If the rebels can cut the highway here, they could effectively trap Assad's men in Idlib, making it harder for them to receive reinforcements from further south. Cutting the highway is crucial to the success of the wider rebel offensive. They have lookouts positioned in various areas along the highway. Hamad Hassan, Hamad Hassan. Hamad Hassan, with you. What are you doing? What are you doing? A few days ago, Abu Mahmoud and his men damaged this bridge with an improvised explosive device planted under cover of darkness. Yesterday, they took out a tank here. The highway is still protected by a Syrian army checkpoint. But it's not the only regime presence. There's little cover except the olive groves, and they don't provide much. The rebels are trying to create their own cover. They've been digging this trench now for about two days, and um, the aim is to get it as close as they can to the highway. They've got several hundred meters to go to get closer to this ribbon of asphalt along the tree line. It looks like a country road, but it's actually part of the highway. Assad's forces won't let that happen easily. Warplanes are a constant threat. We get off the bikes and look for cover. The regime may have been forced to retreat to several bases on the ground, but it still dominates the air. It's coming our way, it's coming our way, it's coming our way. It's coming our way. It's coming our way. It didn't drop anything this time, but there was evidence of previous strikes everywhere. Haji Zaki's family has joined the more than two million Syrians who are internally displaced. Hey, the Beitel, uh, that's, his, that's his house over there. It's his brother's house over here. They were sitting here, they were having coffee. The family was sitting here. You can still see the uh, coffee, the tray. The coffee was served on here. He said the first, and you can still see, the first missile landed there. You can see the crater. Just in front of his parents' house. The second one landed here next to a tree. طيب هيدا بيتك يعني قديش كم سنة قعد فيه هيدا؟ هذا بيتي قعد فيه تقريبا شي 12 سنة أهم شيء لإلي الذكريات الماضية من صور شخصية بس يعني إلي ولأفراد أسرتي لأبوي الله يرحمه وللأخوي وللباقي ما بيهمني كثير لأنه هذا كلياته بيتعوض falls in Idlib province. As we drive back to the Farouk base, Commander Hajji Zaki turns off the lights to avoid detection by Assad's men just across the olive grove. This home is the fourth base the unit has occupied in as many months. The others were all bombed. There's no power. The generator is intermittent. As we split loaves of Arabic bread, the men share pictures and stories. Abu Brahim is a former construction worker turned sniper. He served his compulsory military service with the 11th Division. The same unit, he says, is now stationed in Wedid Def. Abu Sami is Haji Zaki's younger brother. His only child, Sami, is seven months old. The talk switches easily from families to friends who have been killed to the fight ahead. The lack of ammunition is a common complaint, 
Most of the rebel supplies are bought either on the black market or from corrupt Assad soldiers. Much is war booty. There are supporters, Syrian and foreign, local and overseas, who provide weapons and money to select groups, often with strings attached that are usually pledges of loyalty. This competition for resources is aggravating rifts within the armed opposition, and the patronage networks being forged could set Syria up for a bloody round of infighting, even after the fall of the regime. Warlords are emerging. Colonel Afif Sleiman pays a visit to the Farouk headquarters. He's the head of the Free Syrian Army's military council in Idlib. It's meant to incorporate most of the groups on the ground. There's a council in each of Syria's 14 provinces. But the Free Syrian Army has never really been an organized military force, just a loose franchise outfit. That's a fact often cited as a reason why the rebels have not received greater material support from the international community. But without that support, the councils have little leverage over the men on the ground. <laughs> Colonel Sleiman says international support has dropped off considerably when the U.S. designated one of the fighting groups a terrorist organization. The U.S. says the conservative Islamist group Jabhat al-Nusra has ties to al-Qaeda, a claim it denies. And here on the front lines, Jabhat al-Nusra is widely respected by other rebels for its disciplined fighting prowess. It fights with, but is not part of, the Free Syrian Army. The colonel leaves. We all bed down for the night. The mortar and gunfire continue for hours. The next morning, there's no electricity. The men hook up a car battery to watch Al Jazeera and the latest news. This unit works in 12-hour shifts. These men have just come back from an overnight patrol, and they have stories to tell. Abu Ibrahim says he shot a man just after dawn. The mood is upbeat as the men change shifts. We are in the courtyard, about to head out, when another rebel group not far away comes under fire. Yeah. 
Later that morning, we visit the colonel in his office. He's meeting local military commanders, going over what they'll need for the coming offensive. The men are frustrated with the U.S. blacklisting of Jabhat al-Nusra. They don't understand why the group has been singled out and labeled a terrorist outfit. We move next door to where the council is distributing small amounts of supplies. It's not much. This batch has been brought up from a bigger secret underground depot. This young defector, whose specialty in the military was mortars, has just received this mortar launcher. It's new, but he's concerned it's not enough. We continue to meet the men on another front line. This is Maharit al naman the major city in this part of southern Idlib. It's a devastated wasteland. The damage wrought here is testament to its strategic location. Parts of it are under regime control. Other stretches belong to the rebels. Some rebel groups in the city are trying to take out the second large outpost protecting the Wadid Daif military base. It's called al Hamidi. This is Abu Akram. He's part of the Islamist Sakur al-Sham brigades. He used to be a national discus champion, an activist who once organized peaceful protests. Now, he says he has 43 pieces of shrapnel in his body and a broken jaw. They take us to see their frontline positions. These men are Islamists who, like a fair number of rebel groups, want an Islamic state. But what that means is up for discussion. Abu Akram compares Syria's emerging political landscape to a marketplace where all factions can display their wares or ideas. His idea is Islam. The Syrian revolution has long been called a revolution of orphans by its participants because it has lacked robust foreign support. Some rebels say they don't want help if it comes with strings attached. The lack of international support has bred both resentment and pride. It has also pushed the rebels to become more resourceful. In Syria, if you want weapons, you have to buy, steal, or make your own. Abu Hussein has been making his own rockets for more than a year now. He's bringing them to the wedded day fight. He used to be a civil servant. His colleague, Abu Khalid, is an army defector. Each empty rocket weighs about 11 kilos. It has three parts. The body, stacked with potassium and sugar, the explosive head, which is mainly aluminum nitrates, and a detonator. 
The Freedom 3 has a range of 12 to 15 kilometers. They're using the street signs uh, for the fins of the rocket. <laughs> They're also making their own rocket launches. This is a prototype made to standard specifications so that it can fire projectiles captured from the regime. They've taken their rockets to battles in Hama, Aleppo, and now they're getting orders all the way from Damascus. They don't sell them, they give them away. Each rocket costs several hundred dollars to produce. I ask where they get the money from. <laughs> we were on our way to another front line in this new multi-pronged offensive when we chanced upon a surprising sight, a female fighter. M. Joseph is a rarity, a fighter with the Islamist Sakur al-Sham brigades. In Syria, a patriarchal society, you will find women in field hospitals or helping smuggle weapons past government checkpoints. But you will rarely find a woman on the front line. She was once briefly married and has no children. She was nicknamed M. Joseph by a rebel leader. M. Joseph was a popular fictional character in a Syrian soap opera about the struggle for independence. These homes have been appropriated by the rebels. The dishes from lunch are still in the sink. She shows me what she made, eggs, yogurt and potatoes. She also has a message for Bashar al-Assad. <laughs> M. Joseph takes us to meet her men. Her older brother is part of this battalion, as well as her 13-year-old nephew, who carries a gun. M. Joseph is a valued member of the unit. She takes us to see her section of the Abu Dhur front line, where she was this morning. Two days ago, her, her and her men were here. And this uh, house was struck. They were just here. This is the front. This is the front. Just keep the camera low. The airport has been besieged for months. It's a helicopter airbase. Its 20 or so aircraft have effectively been grounded or destroyed. Very little gets in or out. Helicopters from elsewhere have to airdrop supplies. We head back to the Farouk headquarters outside Wedded Def. It's busier than usual. They're preparing for the upcoming battle, gathering ammunition, holding strategic meetings. Men from other units are checking in. Commander Haji Zaki is pleased that there is greater consensus among all the groups participating. Outside, his men are ready for the fight ahead. Last month, after this film was made, Syrian regime forces managed to break the siege on the bases at Wadi Daif and Hamidiyah. The rebels are now trying to re-establish the blockade.